Halle, 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 Luja. Halle, 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 Luja. Halleluja, Halleluja. Special request to do it twice. Are you ready? Halle, 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 Luja. Halle, 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 Luja. Halle, 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 Luja. Halleluja, Halleluja. We're going to need it for this gospel on the 13th Sunday, <laughs> in the season of Pentecost, from continuing the stories of discipleship from Luke chapter 14, today, verses 25 to 33. Now large crowds were following with him, Jesus, and he turned and said to them, whoever comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even life itself, cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry the cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, intending to build a tower, does not first sit down and estimate the cost to see whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he's laid a foundation and is not able to finish it, all who see it will begin to ridicule him, saying, This fellow began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, going out to wage war against another king, will not sit down first and consider whether he is able with 10,000 to oppose the one who comes against him with 20,000. If he cannot, then while the other is still far away, he sends a delegation and asks for terms, the terms of peace. So therefore, none of you can become my disciple if you do not give up all your possessions. This is the gospel of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. You caught that question mark, did you? Whoo! Uh, my sermon title is The Shape of Water. Now, when I announced that, somebody reminded me that there was a movie by the same name. Apparently, it won awards in 2017. I had forgotten that I had seen it, The Shape of Water. Go ahead and uh, go forward to that one, uh, Luke. Uh, the Shape of Water. It's a strange story. There, it, it was, it's actually... Some nice parallels as I started thinking about what I'm driving at, but uh, this is not an endorsement of the movie. It's a little wacky. It's not really family-friendly, and it, the movie works on the premise of being a monster movie sci-fi love story. Uh, you work it out. Um, but what I am driving at is more clearly expressed by the pictures that you've been seeing on the screen as well as on your bulletin today, so go forward to that one, to the Anacapa picture. Uh, this is one taken off of our coast near Anacapa Island. Uh, what's left of what was believed to be a land bridge, uh, which is only now an arch that is shaped by water. Go to the next one. The desert scene that's on the cover of our uh, bulletin today is a picture of Antelope Canyon. And how many of you have been to the slot canyons out there in the desert? Yeah. Oh, really? You guys have not, there's only like four people. Either You're either shy and you won't raise your hand or you're really missing something. So uh, the slot canyons are out in Arizona uh, one of the slot canyons near, this is one of the slot canyons in the southwest near Lake Powell. Uh, they are carved by water, flash flood water actually, that rages down the canyons with sand and rocks and timber that carves these walls the way they are after millions of years of rain. When the water's gone, you're left with this beautiful slot canyon. Sometimes the container is shaped by what it contains. So it is with the Christian life. St. Paul told us in Romans that we, our bodies, are the temples of the Holy Spirit. We contain the sacred life of God here in imperfect vessels, in imperfect containers, as a result of the gift of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit fell upon the church. It's a season that we're currently celebrating in our church's life. The question is, how do we become saints? And the answer is, well, it's the shape of water. 
There's, a, there's an old fable, some of you might know it, of an old scoundrel who tried to give up his rotten life, but no one would ever forget it, you know, kept coming after him, kind of like the guy who tried to build, whose neighbors kept saying, you tried to build, but you couldn't finish. Finally, he, he took up residence in a, a monastery far from the world, and the abbot told him uh, that he needed to wear a mask. You know, he wanted to wear a mask because he wanted to hide who he had been, the shame of his past. And whenever people saw him, they would be more than willing to remind him of what kind of scoundrel he was. And so uh, he put on a mask, and this mask was this, the mask of a saint. So the scoundrel took his place in the communal life of the monastery, living among the monks, acting like them, self-emptying to be filled with Christ, self-emptying to be filled with Christ. Every day, the pattern of self-emptying to be filled with Christ. So some time had gone on, but one day, someone from his past came to the monastery and recognized the man, even with the mask, and proclaimed him to be a fraud, challenging the man to come clear about his rotten life and stop pretending to be a saint, a hypocrite. The accuser finally demanded that the man remove his mask. Slowly, begrudgingly, the accused man came forward and said, all that this person has said was true. That is the kind of person I have been. He thanked their, the brotherhood for their hospitality and their communal life that was so important to these last years that he has been with them, but clearly now I need to show you who I really am. And so with a lot of encouragement from the accuser, of course, to show his true self, with great sadness, the man reached up and he peeled away the mask of the saint that he has worn all those years. And to everyone's astonishment, he revealed the face of a saint. A life shaped by working, shaped by what the container was trying to contain, and finally he was unwittingly a saint. The container shaped by what it contained. We would probably agree that the Christian life is to be a moral life. However, that's not its primary aim. Christians often get this wrong. A whole generation of us Christians, and probably most of the folks in the room can kind of relate to this, there were Christians that tried to organize ways for people to have clean hearts. How do we stay pure became the question. And so I lived into this even as a Lutheran kid back in the Midwest. Someone decided who was unclean, and they set up a program to keep people clean away from that. So we had conversion therapies, right? We've been hearing a lot about that in the news lately. We saw the rise and fall of Bill Goddard, the Citadel ministry that promoted a rigorous form of sexual purity for teenagers, you know, no, no dating before marriage sort of uh, set up, and girls suffered under that regime, I think, even more because, well, boys will be boys, you know, and therefore... Uh, we not so subtly made girls responsible to control male drives, you know. I'm sure for all you women out there, you probably know what that was like. Or you might remember rock music, you know, when that first came out in the 70s, rock music was the devil's music, you know. And, and weirdly enough, the evangelical churches that pushed that were the ones who finally most embraced that. So today, if you go to an evangelical church, you're going to get rock music. But we were told that we needed to throw our, our records and eight tracks into the bonfires because uh, there was backward masking that was promoting satanic messages. And then finally some artists actually did backward mask some things into their things. I can't remember, there was uh, some hilarious examples of it. We got prescriptive about morality, right? Now imagine our gospel reading today, if this is a prescription, if Jesus is saying, you must do this. Luke 14, if you do not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even life itself, you cannot be my disciple. So when you go to lunch later with mom, uh, you can say, the gospel tells me I have to hate you, so sorry, mom. Is that, that's a prescription. Do we, do we really think that this is what Jesus wants us to do? Break our covenantal relationships with family? I mean, there is a command about honoring father and mother as well. Is Jesus saying, no, this is, you know, is this prescriptive kind of morality? I mean, it's a dangerous passage to take with stilted literalisms. I don't think Jesus, Jesus is not requiring you to hate people, especially those that you're in covenant love to care for. 
Did Jesus hate his own mother? No, I think not. For in his dying moments, he remembered to provide for her care. Did Jesus hate his life? No, I think not. But he was unwilling to let his life stand in the way of bringing about salvation for the whole world. It was a telos, a, a purpose. He wasn't allowing lesser things to stand in the way of the greater purpose. He was shaped by this purpose, and we are to be shaped by his presence. Here in worship, we're not just to know something about God, but we're to encounter God. A, a failing, especially among us intellectual Lutherans, that tends to be, we're the rationalists, you know, we sort of rationalize things, you know. We like a lot of knowledge about God, but we don't actually often know God or have an experience with God. But that's what worship is about. When you come to worship, you, you shouldn't come to find out some interesting fact about Pastor Craig or some interesting twist on the, on the gospel reading. You should come expectant to meet God. You should be hopeful and prayerful that you would meet God. And with that kind of anticipation, I would imagine that even in our liturgical styles, and if you're not a liturgical person, you would be able to meet God. What we can take literally from what Jesus said in our gospel reading today is his encouragement to understand that following him will take shape in your life and that shape will have consequences. Now, now many of the people who first heard, the ones for whom Luke was actually written, I don't think he had anything in mind that there was going to be us sitting here at the end of the earth 2,000 years later listening to his words of this letter or this narrative about the life of Jesus. But for those who were listening to the first time that someone read Luke's gospel, those who were there, because of their faith, many of them had been excluded from their synagogues, from their communities. Many of them had lost relationships with family members, friends, parents, spouses, children. Their lives were living examples of the contours, if you will, or the, the implications of a life that was shaped by the presence of Jesus, the shape of a life containing Jesus. Many of us have experienced the stilted literalisms in our own life if we decided at some point, especially among our older members, if we decided to marry outside the faith, you know, I'm looking at my good Catholic Lutheran partners here in the front, you know, uh, how difficult that was. And if you married outside of your faith, you might be excommunicated. I've even taken part in, in uh, the processes in the Roman church to get annulments of couples that I've married. One was Protestant, one was, Luther, uh, one was Catholic, and they, they didn't work it out, and so they ended an annulment, and there was a court case. Basically, an annulment said it never really happened. You see how stilted literalism brings out just the dark underbelly of trying to fit people into slots and not contain their true humanity? But the shape of the life of Jesus has clear implications. E each of our readings today talks about the shape of a life. You know, in the, in the first reading is this great, it's actually a great uh, example of the freedom that God gives us. He says, I set before you today life and death, prosperity and need. I set these things before you, but I encourage you to choose life. You're free to shape your life anyway, but shape your life around the, the law that is the delight of love. Our, our second reading, which is, uh, I only kept it because it's the only time we get Philemon in a three-year reading cycle, and that poor guy needs to have his one chapter uh, lesson read, and so it was today, Omnisius was a runaway slave. Philemon is a slave owner, now, it's really super problematic for me that, that Paul doesn't question slavery at all because he's, he's the guy who did say there's no longer male or free, slave or free, a slave nor free, there's, there's just all one in Christ. But he doesn't, he doesn't question the institution of slavery. Uh, that's for later disciples to do. But he does say to Philemon that the shape of the life of discipleship requires certain behaviors from you, even in this category of being a slave owner that you cannot treat this slave however you want because he is a brother in Christ and therefore not simply your slave. And you must behave differently because you are not just a slave owner, but you are a Christian. The thing that is being contained shapes the container. And it's true for us. What surprises me is that so many Christians today just don't get this. You know, it's a, Gandhi once said, you know, I like your Christ. It's your Christians that I just don't understand. <laughs> You know, 
And, you know, here, here, Gandhi. I mean, I, I, I completely get it. There's, there's so many that, that don't understand that we are to be shaped by the thing that we are to, to contain. There's so many Christians that just settle for membership in the church and, and don't understand that we're to contain something, a message that is to shape the contours of our life and change who we are and to have their implications. Luther said that one of the true signs of the church would be the presence of suffering, the result of the contours of following the rules of a kingdom that is not of this world but is to be applied to living out in this world. And sometimes they mismatch. And of course, there are natural consequences for that. Some of us, though, have settled for a kind of Christianity that is pure prescription for living clean lives. You know, sort of like it's God's goal um, for us to just be clean, you know, like God is the original Mr. Clean, you know, the tall, bald guy, you know. But no, that's not the kind of God we have. So uh, go forward to the next slide, Luke. I, I want you to think a little bit about the difference between trying to stay clean and trying to be empty. Trying to stay clean is the moral category. Trying to be empty, to be filled with Christ, is the discipleship category. Many Christians think that God has commanded us to stay clean by avoiding contact with people and things that are unclean. Today in our lesson, it would be fathers and mothers and children and spouses and you know, brothers and sisters. And, and I don't believe that God has any invested in us, in us staying clean for the sake of being clean. I believe God wants our hearts to be emptied of clutter so that we can be filled up with his love. We can encounter him deeply, transformatively, like the slot canyons are transformed by the presence of water. When Christians try to stay clean instead of getting empty to be filled, it's a recipe for toxic, judgmental faith that lacks self-awareness but is full of self-righteousness. You know Christians like this. You might even be a Christian like this. What does it look like? What does it look like for those who show compassion and who serve the common good? Because, well, that's what Jesus would have them do. I, I had a friend, remind, a, a member of the church had this happen not too long ago, but a friend of mine also had uh, something very similar happen. They were on a business trip, they passed an alley where there was a man, well-dressed, obviously in distress, sitting against the wall of one of these alleys, clearly in distress. Unselfconsciously, this friend of mine went to the aid of the injured man, and of course, it was a setup for a group of thieves. And the friend, uh, as a Christian, uh, a part of his motivation, of course, was to serve the one in need. But the shape of what shaped the container had consequences because not everyone shares this commitment to be motivated by compassion and love. And he was exploited. Afterwards, I think the, the harder part for my friend was to keep his heart, heart supple, soft, loving, not jaded and closed and self-protective, which would be the moral path rather than the path of the disciple. And I think that's what's at stake for us today, Lord. Uh, Lord. Apparently, I'm talking to God now. <laughs> my friends, my friends, um, it, is that we would keep our hearts supple, open, compassionate. So, so much of our world is oriented toward the opposite. Either, either complete license or some moral perfectionism project that turns out to turn us into Pharisees, which we know neither are the goal, of course. It's something in between. And I would say the goal of our lives is to become emptied of our self-preoccupation. The goal of Christian life is, is not to keep ourselves perfectly clean and absent of any scars or smudges. The goal is to be emptied enough of our self-preoccupation that we can lose ourselves in the immense love of God for us. And if you're preoccupied with staying clean or even safe, then you're still preoccupied with yourself. And this is the journey. It's not about perfectly doing it because life is a challenge. My friend who had this happen to him, it was a challenge for him not to pass by those in need and be afraid. It was a part of the spiritual landscape he needed to work on by emptying himself of worry and fear to again be possessed, not with himself, but with the God of love and mercy. Now, this, is a, this is a hard lesson. 
I need 20 more minutes to kind of fill it out, um, but you're not going to give that to me. Uh, so uh, let's go to the summary. Um, here's the summary. Here's the, here's the statement. God does not require a clean people whose moral cit uh, citadels are immaculate enough that God can walk down the hallways with a white glove and just go across and not come up with a speck of dust. God wants people who are deeply nourished by God's presence that their hearts are emptied of concern for lesser things. This is what it means to pick up the cross and follow him, to follow one who was led by a purpose greater than itself and its self-preservation. Not clean purity, but emptied to be filled with God's love. A container shaped by what it contains. Not clean purity, but empty to be filled with God. A container shaped by what it contains. God's, God wants people with hearts that are emptied enough of self-preoccupation that they are ready to go out with God and to get dirty, doing justice and loving mercy in a messy world. And this way versus the way of Pharisaic perfectionism is a way of grace, not only for the world, but of the self. It's a way of keeping our hearts tender in a hardened world. It's a way of expressing love in a divided and hateful world. It's called the way of the cross. It's a hard way, but we are invited into it because when we go that way, we find the Lord of life going with us. I set before you today, Deuteronomy told us, life and death. Choose life. Amen. Folks, let's sing together our gospel hymn.